everyone, welcome back. In this video, we will be learning about aromatic hydrocarbons. Now, aromatic hydrocarbons contain benzene. And benzene in its expanded structure form looks like this. Six carbons in a ring with what appears to be alternating double and single bonds. And based on valence bond theory, I'm going to abbreviate as VBT, you would have identified those carbons to be sp2 hybridized with 120 degree bond angle and to be trigonal planar. Now it is true that benzene is a planar molecule. However, valence bond theory fails to really describe what's actually happening here. Um, to have a true understanding of aromatic hydrocarbons like benzene and its derivatives, you would need to use molecular orbital theory. We will not dive into molecular orbital theory. Once again, in a more advanced chemistry course like organic chemistry, you would dive more into that type of theory. But some cool things about benzene and aromatic hydrocarbons is that actually, although it may appear that they are double single, double single bonds, and you would have learned in first semester general chemistry that double bonds are shorter than single bonds, that's not the case here with benzene and other aromatic hydrocarbons. All the bonds have the same length. Both experimental and theoretical evidence shows this. The true structure of benzene is actually a hybrid of two resonance structures, which I'll discuss in a little bit. And because of this, they reacted differently than alkenes. And that's why we're discussing them separately. So let's come back to resonance structures. It's something that you would have learned in first, um, first semester general chemistry is that resonance are two or more Lewis structures. They have the same skeletal structure but different electron arrangement. So you can imagine that if we did use valence bond theory to understand this a little better, that each of these has an unhybridized p orbital because they're sp2. And that these electrons, that the pi electrons, remember, are shared between these unhybridized p orbitals, they actually move around each of these carbon atoms. Like they're constantly moving. It's not a static picture as we draw on our paper, right? They actually are moving. And so, for example, here, the two pi electrons here are between, and let me go ahead and number, it'll be easier to discuss this between carbons one and two. But because in reality they're moving throughout, because look, between carbons two and three, they're also a place for them to hang out as well. They can move here, there's available space for them, available orbitals. Um, because of that, we can draw another structure to help represent what we call a delocalization of these pi electrons. And so the way we represent this is we use arrows. And so the arrow points between carbons two and three. And anytime you have like the tail of the arrow here and then it's pointing, it's saying these two electrons are moving here. 
But so that we obey the octet rule, remember carbon cannot break the octet rule, then we have to move these two electrons here between four and five and these electrons here. And so you end up with another benzene ring where it appears the double bonds have moved around. Um, but remember that these structures are the same as one another. We are just limited by drawing in two dimensions on this paper. We can't draw, for example, let's say you had a benzene ring here. You couldn't draw it looking like this um, because then you're breaking all sorts of octet rules um, for those carbon atoms. So that's not the correct picture. Um, so a way that chemists get around that is that they draw resonance structures to illustrate the delocalization of pi electrons. As the name suggests, these electrons are not localized. They're not static at the position. They are actually delocalized, which means they're moving throughout. So let me repeat that again. This is very important. Um, resonant structures are two or more Lewis structures that have the same skeletal. It looks very similar, but they have different electron arrangement here. Alkenes, you know, if you just have one double bond, for example, it doesn't have resonance structures. You would have to, you would need a conjugated system for that to happen. So alternating double, single, double, single bonds, maybe not necessarily in a ring structure, but for that to have resonance structures, and that's something you would dive in later on. But due to the lack of resonance structures for alkenes, they behave very differently than these aromatic compounds and their derivatives. Okay. So let's go ahead and discuss nomenclature. It's a little bit different than what we've done before with the alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. And let's start off with the simplest, monosubstituted benzenes. Monosubstituted benzenes only have one hydrogen that has been substituted. And usually when you name monosubstituted benzenes, you have the name of the substituent and then benzene is the parent name. We always number on the ring here as well. We do not number the substituent itself. So what is the substituent? This is an ethyl group. And so the name of this particular molecule is called ethyl benzene. And it's okay to not write one in front of ethyl, or you could write one ethyl benzene. There's more than one substituent. We're going to discuss that in a little bit. And then we'll definitely need to number the substituents. Okay, so. These aromatic derivatives have been around for a long time, even before IUPAC was set into place um, as a committee to give a very systematic way of naming. So there's some common names for these aromatic derivatives that you should learn. So if you have a methyl benzene, this is called toluene. You have a methyl group on a benzene ring that's called toluene, and that would be used as the parent name if that was what was present in your molecule. If you have an amine group on a benzene ring, this is called aniline. If you have an alcohol, this is called phenol. And if you have a double bond attached, which we refer to as a vinyl group, but this one's called styrene. And if you ever have those foam containers, 
um, then that's polystyrene. Styrene is the monomer that's used to make polystyrene. Now, if the parent chain is longer than six carbons, then benzene becomes a substituent, and we refer to that as a phenyl group. Different than phenol, which was the hydroxybenzene, right? But this is a phenyl group. And so in this case here, what is the longest carbon chain? Looks like it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? And that's an alkane. So what is the parent name? Excellent, heptane. And what are the two substituents? We have a methyl group and a phenyl group. Very good. And now we need to number, and we need to number such that the substituents get the lowest number. So we need to number from this direction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We treat the aromatic ring like it's any other alkyl substituents. I think sometimes when students see the benzene ring, they think it looks very important. Indeed, it does <laughs> seem like it looks important. However, we just treat it as just any other alkyl substituent. It doesn't have priority. So that is why we numbered uh, closer to the methyl group so that the substituent gets the lowest number. Otherwise, it would have been one, two, three to reach the first substituent. And so we have a um, two methyl and a five phenyl. And we have to glue this all together such that the substituents are in alphabetical order. And so methyl before phenyl. So two methyl, five phenyl, heptane. All right. Now let's discuss disubstituted benzenes. Now this is where two hydrogens have been substituted. Now it's really important here when you run into disubstituted or more um, that you determine the order of numbering on the ring by the alphabetical order of the substituents. For the most part, we're gonna discuss a little bit priority in a second here. Um, however, we won't dive in too deep in that in this course. So determine order of numbering on the ring by the alphabetical order of substituents. All right, so for example here, it looks like we have a disubstituted benzene ring. We have a bromo group and a chloro group, right? We only number on the ring, right? And so which one would I number first, the bromine or the chlorine? Well, based on this rule here, you would go alphabetical order in this case, you would number the bromine. And so this would be one and this would be two. And so the way we would write this name would be one bromo, two chloro, benzene as the parent name. All right. The second example is a little bit different here. What you will find is that we have this group here, and we saw this on the previous page where there were some common names, and you would learn in organic class that alcohols do tend to have priority. Um, so this entire, and let me highlight it here, this entire group here is a phenol, 
And if something for these aromatic hydrogens takes the parent name, so now we don't have benzene, but we have phenol, then this group here that took on that suffix ending actually gets placed position one. This is position one here, because now we're working with phenol and that hydroxy group gets priority. And now we have to decide how to number. Now we decide we number clockwise or counterclockwise. Well, you fall back on the rule to give the substituents the lowest number. And so in this case here, you would number clockwise. One, two, three, so that the isopropyl group here gets position three. So the name of this compound is 3-isopropyl phenol. And it's okay if you wanted to put a 1 in front of the OL um, ending as we've done before with alkenes and alkynes. However, it's not necessary because if we say phenol, then it's understood that that's the priority substituent um, since it's a suffix ending and that gets position one. Now, it is very common to use a different way to indicate numbering for disubstituted benzene derivatives. And this is, once again, another historical um, way of naming aromatic compounds. Um, it's called ortho, meta, and para. And they represent the position. So if you have something that's 1, 2 disubstituted, then that is ortho. The 1, 3 is meta. And 1, 4 is para. And that's used in place of numbering. And the reason why we teach this is because if you order... Um, chemicals from a chemical company, then a lot of times it will have orthodibromobenzene. And it's important that you understand that ortho stands for, well, it's 1,2-dibromo, for example. And so in addition, if you take OCHEM, you'll learn about infrared spectroscopy and that in the fingerprint region, you can distinguish between ortho, meta, and para substitution patterns. Um, so it's just something to think of and to remember. Now, it's in place of numbering. So you never say ortho 1,2-dibromobenzene. Like you just say ortho-dibromobenzene if that's the case. Okay. So let's look at this one here. And we did this one earlier already in terms of numbering. But now we understand that this bromochlorobenzene is actually, it's a 1-2 substitution pattern, so the way we can designate that is ortho, bromo, chlorobenzene. Okay, just like when we learned about cis and trans in the alkene video, here, we put, you know, how we said that cis and trans gloves out front. Same thing with the ortho, meta, or para. Once again, do not include the 1, 2, 1, 3, or 1, 4 if you're using ortho, meta, para. So the name of the next example would be what? Good. Meta, bromo, chloro, benzene. And the last one would be para bromochlorobenzene. Very good. Now, something I just want to emphasize here is that orthometa para can only be used for disubstituted. Benzenes only, benzene derivatives only. If you have a tri-substituted benzene, for example, you cannot use ortho, meta, or para. All right, thank you for watching and see you next time.